New Smyrna Beach. And I think I heard that somebody's from Wisconsin here. Yeah, all right, great. Michigan, maybe? Did I hear that too? Somewhere over here? Yeah, right. Well, I'm also from Michigan, and uh, glad to be down here right now. But it's actually getting warmer up there, although it snowed this week, so we don't want to talk about that. But uh, I got a little carried away with my children's story, so I'm going to try to have to shorten the sermon. But I have a problem. I've got two sermons I need to preach all at once. So I'm going to preach the first one uh, right now. Are you ready? We're ready. Okay. The first one is this. Last time I was here, I preached a sermon. I would like you to remember that sermon. And that is the first sermon. Okay. So I'll remind you what I said in that sermon. What I said, ah, it's an emergency. That's exactly right. We're living... In the last dread days, and Jesus is about to come again. Amen. I told you the story of little Edvaic and how that he was uh, able to save a man who was drowning, but it truly was not just little Edvaic. It was all the people that made it possible to save that man who was drowning that day. And one of the things I reminded us of is that sometimes just being there is part of what God needs us to do. We're going to have a series of meetings, a nice short series of meetings centered around this coming week and weekend when the world tends to focus its attention on the death of Christ. And because of that, we're going to take that time when people are thinking along that way and remind them of the fact that Jesus not only died that they might live, but He lives that they might live. And He told us all the things we need to know in order to be ready when He comes, even giving us an idea of what the world would be like just before He comes. And that's the way the world is right now. But you know what? There are going to be people here who've never been here before. And it's going to feel strange to them to be in a place where they've never been before. And if they come in and find the place empty, it will feel even stranger. Because if it's just me and one other person talking, they're going to be uncomfortable. And so am I. But if it is as full as it is today, you will be preaching a loud and a sermon to be heard. Because you will be preaching that this message is so important that even you came to hear the message. And that's a really important sermon. And there will be some people whose lives will be changed because you came. And you got some good instructions from Mrs. Race here a little while ago about how we should treat each other and uh, be kind to the people who come and the visitors who come. And we're so excited that people have already called and said that they're planning to come. Isn't that great news? Amen. How many of you got a brochure in the mail? Anybody get a brochure in the mail? Well, one or two or three. You all must live in Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, I uh, hope that's not a bad sign. Maybe we need to check and make sure that they went out and all that, but apparently they did a little bit. Well, I uh, that was the first sermon, okay? So I'm done with that sermon. Sorry, the next one's going to be a little longer. All right, there we go. I want to talk to you about light. You know, there's a... There's an advertisement that's been out there for a long time. You know, once in a while, the marketing people just get the right ad that just hits people. And it lasts forever. Got milk, right? You knew that's where that came from. It just kind of resonates with people. But you know, there's something more important than what the dairy industry wants us to remember. And that's what the Bible tells us. I want us to think today about the light. By the way, just before I get into the sermon, I want to show you a picture. I actually contacted the um, Royal, I can't remember exactly what it is, Royal Music or something or other, where my grandmother um, got her award from in England. And I had heard this story as a child, but you know, sometimes these urban legends or these family legends, you find out they really aren't true after all. And I thought, you know, I've been telling this story for an awful long time. I better go and find out if there's any truth to it. 
And I uh, actually, with the internet and all, was able to contact them and actually verify that my mother did play in that contest many, many years ago. And I asked them if they had a copy of the medal, and they said, well, they weren't absolutely sure because they had some different ones, but this was as close as they could come to it, and they sent me a picture of it, and that's what it looked like, all that pain for that piece of metal like that. The reason we don't have it is because, like things do, my mom, my grandmother grew up in South Africa, and, um, and the family, and she lost it in a, in a fire. And so we don't have it today. So that's as close as I can come. All right, I want to talk to you about light. How many books have been written in modern times? Anybody want to try to guess? How many books have been written? Well, I came up with the idea that I needed to know that, so I went to the people that know everything. Google. And I asked them, and sure enough, they had to have some idea how many books they were, and I found out the reason they needed to know how many books they were is because books are information. Google is about information. So they had to have some idea how big was their project of trying to find out everything. And so somebody created an algorithm that figured out how many books there's supposed to be. And in case you didn't know and wanted to know, there are 129,864,880 books. Give or take a few. And this was a little while ago, so maybe there are a few more or less, or a few less now. I don't know. A few more, a few less. At any rate, all those books out there, if you had to be a reader and read all those books in order to be saved, you better get started. <coughs> you better have started when you were the day you were born and read a book every minute, and even then, I think you'd probably be in trouble. How many books are there in the Book of Congress, Library of Congress, I should say? Well, the good news is there's not as many there. So if you have to read all those books in order to be saved, you've got 38 million to read. And if you're a slow reader like me, it's going to take you more than one minute to read a book. So you had really better get started. Well, you understand, I actually, my wife, the first time I preached the sermon, she asked me, she said, what are you preaching about tomorrow? I said, I'm reading, preaching about... Uh, the uh, one book you need to read, and I said, which book do you need to read to be saved? And how many books do you need to read to be saved? And she said, none. Now, you got to understand my wife. She's always a little devil's advocate, always a little honorary, if she can be. And she was making a point, though, that's actually true. Do I have to read a book to be saved? No. I need to know Jesus Christ as my Savior. Yes? But... There is one book that leads me to my Savior. Yes. And if you're going to read any book, and you're going to know any book, you need to know the Bible. Because all of those books that are out there, only one contains the information that is the source of salvation. It's the Bible. Now, there's some interesting statistics around, relative to the Bible and Americans and their Bibles. Did you know that 88% of Americans own a Bible? As a matter of fact, many own a whole lot more than that. 80% think the Bible is sacred. That's kind of interesting to me. People have a Bible, but they don't think it's sacred, apparently. Some of them don't think so, but that's not surprising. People have books that they think are just reference material, and some think that's true of the Bible. But... 80% of Americans think the Bible is sacred. 61% wish they read the Bible more, and the average home has 4.4 Bibles. But 50% read the Bible four times or less per year. Four times or less per year. Many more think the Bible is sacred, but they don't read it very often. 26% say they read the Bible regularly, and that is defined as four or more times <coughs> per week. 26% say they read the Bible regularly. Studies show that Seventh-day Adventist members mirror the general 
public. That is the most shocking statistic to me of all. I want to encourage us today that the Word of God is to be studied and that we need to know the Jesus of the Bible. Amen. I want to remind you of what Jesus said in a couple parables this morning. So if you have your Bibles, I'm not sure what you do. Because we're going to be talking about the Bible today, so we need to have our Bibles. In Matthew chapter 13, we're going to look at verse 44, a really short parable. Jesus knew to keep things short, and I'm going to try to do that a little bit today as well. In verse 44, this is what it says. Jesus speaking said, again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid, and for joy over it he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Very short and simple parable. Jesus wants us to know that there is hidden treasure found in the Bible. Now, the parable that Jesus was telling was something that people could relate to. Because in those days, they didn't have banks. And when you don't have banks, and you've got money, hard currency, cash, money, it's a lot easier for people to come and steal it. And when they steal it, and it's gone, it's gone. You can't go put it in the insurance company in those days and say, somebody stole my money, and get your money back. If somebody stole the money in those days, it was gone and usually forever it was somebody else's and you had no money left. So people would do what they could to protect it. There were marauding armies that would come through and they wanted to protect it from there. There were thieves that would come. There were thieves that would come and those thieves would steal it. And there would be dishonest neighbors who would take it. I guess you call them thieves. Other people. And so what they did is sometimes they would take the money they had, especially if they had sizable amounts, and they would bury it somewhere. Often they would bury it out in the ground outside, maybe in their house underneath the floorboards, or they had a dirt floor, dig a hole and do that. But it wasn't unusual to bury it out someplace in the field, and it was great as long as you remembered where it was. But many times people forgot about it, or similarly, they died without telling anybody else where the treasure was, and that was out in the middle of the field, and nobody found it until they came along and they plowed up that field, and that's what Jesus was telling the parable about. This man in this parable found this treasure, and he decided that he wanted to be able to get that treasure because he knew it would set him for life. And so he had one problem. He didn't own the field. In order to be able to have the treasure, he had to own the field. So he sold everything he had. Everybody thought he was crazy. He sold everything he had and he bought the field. Why did he do that? Because that treasure was worth everything to him for the rest of his life. What was Jesus trying to teach us? Jesus was trying to teach us that in the Word of God is found the treasure that will set us for eternity. We need to know what that treasure is. Now I want to illustrate this for a moment for you by telling you a story. Now sometimes I do this and I have kids come up and, and help me with this, but I don't have all my devices here. When you're flying, you can't carry your whole house with you. But when you're driving from church to church in Michigan, I can do that. So we'll do it virtually today up on the screen. And I want you to see what I have here on the screen. That is a shell. Shells are interesting things. When I was a student missionary on the island of Palau, we, um, we lived in an island. You know what's around an island, right? Water. And it's beautiful. It's a beautiful ocean and beautiful blue, crystal blue water, fish of all different colors, and <clears throat> another thing is shells. 
And um, we kind of got into collecting shells while we were there. And uh, the principal's wife was kind of into this, and she was encouraging us to do it. So we would go out often on a little boat, and we would get, uh, we'd go diving for shells. Now, there's just one little problem Royce had. Because when I went out diving for shells, I always came back with zero shells. Everybody else came back with all these shells. And I couldn't figure out what was going on, and I wasn't apparently smart enough in those days to ask questions. And so we would go out, and we'd come back, and you know, the word got around that Royce can't find a shell. So one day we went out diving for shells. And as we were, I was out there swimming, and diving was not with scuba, it was uh, just uh, snorkeling, that's the word I want. And we were just snorkeling around, and as we were going around, I dove down, looking for shells, and everybody was doing the same thing. I came up, and I was near the boat, and somebody said, Royce, did you find any shells? No, I said, I didn't find any shells. Well, they said, we think there's a shell right down below there. Why don't you go look and see if you can find the shell down there? And so I dove down, and I looked, and I looked, and I looked, and I couldn't find the shell. I came back up, and they said, you find it? No. What I found out is they had put the shell there so that I would find it. That was really very nice of them. But it would have been even nicer if they would told me why I was not finding shells. I'm going to illustrate why I couldn't find a shell. Because you see, in this picture is a shell. I want you to know that in that picture is a shell. Okay? Now I'm going to show you my collection of shells. I want you to know that that shell is also somewhere in that picture. Now, I don't know if you would like to guess where, which one of those shells is that shell. But I'm not going to play that game forever. It could be, it could be down in the corner down here. It could be one of those dark ones there or whatever. Now, usually when I ask kids to help me with this, they pick one of those darker kind of spotted shells up near the top or even like the uh, one that's so similar down in the bottom left-hand corner. They choose that shell because, as I again, that shell is in that picture. But the clue is in the name. Do you see the shell? What? Top left-hand corner. Do you notice anything different about this picture and that shell. One is white as can be, the other is black as can be, and there's your clue. Inside the shell is an animal, and the animal comes out of its shell and then wraps it around. And that's how it feeds and gets it and all that kind of thing. But then it goes back inside its shell, and then that's what you see. So when you collect shells out on the beach, the animal's dead. The animal's gone. You're just getting what's left of the shell. But when you're diving down in the water and you're looking for treasure in the water that are shells, you've got to know what you're looking for. They didn't tell me that. This is what it looks like in the water. You can see in the water there a little bit of that animal kind of moved away from the shell, and there's an eggshell cowrie. That is why I couldn't find it. You know, the trouble with the Bible, excuse me for saying something that is wrong with the Bible, is that we often are looking for the wrong thing when we're looking in the Bible. We're looking for what we want and what we understand rather than going there looking for the buried treasure that God isn't trying to hide. It's an open, plain sight, but we are so confused with our sinful minds and hearts we're not listening to the Spirit of God who's trying to tell us what's there. Amen. That's why we need help. Just like I needed help, and I should have asked, you and I need to ask the Spirit of God to help us. Jesus said in John 5, 38 and 39, But you do not have His Word abiding in you, because whom He sent, Him you do not believe. You search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, 
and these are they which testify of me. Yes, they testify of eternal life, but you have to be listening to what God is telling you and not what you want to hear. The Pharisees were listening to what they wanted to hear rather than what Jesus was trying to tell them. Amen. You see, Jesus is the hidden treasure in the Word of God. Praise Amen. The Lord. The Word of God, Jesus was illustrating with a simple parable, reveals Himself and the truth that's there about what leads us to know Him and to be ready when He comes. Jesus is the hidden treasure found in the Word of God. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, he says, But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Amen. This world is confused. Even people who are studying the Bible are confused. Because when we go to the Bible to get our own ideas out of it, we all come away with confusion. Amen. But the Spirit of God is not confused. Amen. And He has promised that He will help us. I like what Paul says in Romans chapter 4, verses 21 to 25. It's on your screen. The gospel, Paul told us, is the light we need. And Paul says this, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. In other words, it wasn't written just for the ancients. It wasn't written just for Abraham or Isaac or somebody else, but it was written also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in Him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. The gospel message I don't have time to go into in detail today, but it's found in the Word of God. And therein is the power to change my life Amen. and your life. To bring about the reality of the righteousness of Christ in us. Not us to our glory. Always, totally, completely dependent upon Jesus. I will never have any strength short of Jesus Christ, my Savior. So why read the Bible? Because therein is hidden treasure found. Jesus told another parable in Matthew 13. So if you're still there, go back there with me, please. If you did get wandering away from there, we're going to go to another parable, a short one that Jesus told in Matthew chapter 13, verse 33. He said, it would help if I were in chapter 14. The breeze changed my page. Here we go. Another parable he said to them, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. In this parable, Jesus is reminding us of the fact that the kingdom of heaven, the experience that God wants us to have through the word of God is like leaven. Now, what I often do with this one, a little harder to illustrate on the screen, is I'll take some leaven. You know what leaven is? <coughs> it's yeast. So you go in the store, you buy some yeast, and you bring it, and you and I what I often do, I'll put it in a little jar of water, and the kids will take a look at that, and they'll I'll show I'll tell them to shake it up. They shake up the jar of water with the yeast. And first of all, they look at the water, and the water is nice and clean and pure, and that looks like something you'd like to drink. And then I ask them after they shake up all the yeast that I put in there if they want to drink it. And it's not so inviting, and it's kind of stinky, too, and they're not interested in drinking it. But that's not the illustration. The illustration is that when you shake it up like that, it begins to mix up in the water. As it mixes up in the water, it just becomes a part of that water. It's all mixed up together. Well, that's what yeast does. It gets into bread, and it infuses itself all through that bread, and that lump of dough turns into a loaf of bread, something I want to eat. 
I like to eat good, wholesome bread. Jesus said, the word of God is like leaven. It's because it is that which transforms my life. It transforms the life of the individual. Paul said in Romans 10, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. John said, sanctify them by your, by your truth. Your word is truth. One Christian author put it this way, if studying and obey the word of God works in the heart, subduing every unholy attribute. The Holy Spirit comes in to convict of sin, and the faith that springs up in the heart works by love to Christ, conforming us in body, soul, and spirit to His image. Then God can do use us to do His will. He changes us. He literally changes us from what we are to what He wants us to be. I want to share a story with you about a young man by the name of Wyatt. His picture is up on the screen. This is actually a picture of Wyatt. Wyatt was about 15 years old and he was sitting in a cold holding cell. He could hear screaming from a nearby room. There were prison bars were rattling that he was sitting behind. You see, he was locked up deep in a state penitentiary in a cell meant for those awaiting the death sentence. Wyatt was only 15 years old and on a prison tour designed to scare young drug addicts straight. It didn't work. He was at that time in the middle of a rehab program. And at that day, he was on a field trip to the prison, to the penitentiary, intended to try to get his attention of where he was going. He went back to the rehab facility, and a, a few days later, he was caught with cigarettes that were contraband, and his counselor came to him and confronted him. But Wyatt was the kind of young man who wasn't willing to listen to anybody, and he got angry when confronted by his counselor. He somehow got his hand on a kitchen knife and came after his counselor and stabbed him several times. The man was taken to the hospital barely alive and Wyatt was taken to jail for real this time. He was convicted and sentenced to prison sitting alone in his new cell for what he had done. He was looking for some kind of answers. He had tried going through the occult and trying Satan worship. He had tried all kinds of different things in his young life, including the drugs that had got him in trouble in the first place here. And he talked to his mother on the phone. His mother said, try the Bible. He didn't want to do that. That was the last thing he wanted to do. But when he would go outside of his cell to lunch or supper or recreation, he would pass by a set of bookshelves outside his cell. And on those bookshelves, among other books, was a Bible. And one day, going back and forth through his cell, he finally said, I'll read that Bible. But my reason for reading the Bible is because I want to show how stupid that book is and how wrong the Christians are, and that's why I'm going to read it. So he took the Bible into his cell, and he started to read it. And as he read the Bible, he found instead that the stories of the people like King David resonated with his own life and how desperately they needed somebody and he needed somebody. And it began to work in his life. He read the Bible, and it started to make a difference. One day he also was able to get a radio, a little transistor radio. You remember those things? Yep. <laughs> and he had this little transistor radio in there, and, and he wasn't getting great reception except when he got up on the top of his bunk and held it up near the... the